<laughs> Psychological disorders. We're going to talk about criteria for disorders. We'll talk about how we define disorders. We'll talk about some examples and then also some of the approaches to treatment for disorders. But most importantly, happy Mustache March. It's my favorite month. I don't know if it's March where you are, but it's March here and it's awesome. All right, let's get into it. So abnormal psychology, here's our definition. It's dedicated to the study and treatment of psychological disorders and mental illnesses. Clinical psychology, health psychology are going to fall under this, but how do we treat it? How do we diagnose? The criteria, we have four criteria um, in a broad sense for mental psychological disorders. The first one is maladaptive behavior. Difficult to fulfill normal function. This can be just like going to school, going to work, not being able to do what you want to do is maladaptive behavior. Personal distress. This is interesting. It's an individual's perception of their emotional distress. So perception is reality in a lot of times. So your perception might be different than mine. A teenager's perception of what is emotionally distressful is going to be different than me as a 42-year-old guy with a mustache. Atypical behavior, ooh, let me move my face, deviates from the cultural or social norm. This goes along with violating social norms, pretty similar. So atypical behavior is just something that's kind of out there. It's not quite normal. It's a little weird. If I, as a psychology teacher, come into my class, take off my shoe and start banging on the wall for three minutes, kids are going to be like, Something, something's not quite right with this guy. Uh, but violating social norms is going beyond that and doing something that's really not acceptable right? You're getting called down to the principal's office. Labeling patients may lead to some negative unintended consequences. We'll talk about some positives of labeling here in a little bit, but first off, let's start with the Rosenhan experiment. This is fascinating. He sent mentally healthy patients, people to psychiatric hospitals and kind of wanted to see what would happen. So check out this video. Really interesting. 1975, American psychologist David Rosenhan published a paper called On Being Sane in Insane Places, detailing the experiment that he conducted on psychiatric institutions themselves. The first part of his experiment involved sending pseudo-patients, a group of eight totally mentally sound associates, including David himself, to knock on institution doors and falsely report that they'd been hearing voices. Once admitted, the fake patients abandoned their fake symptoms and behaved as they normally did, waiting for administrators to recognize them as mentally healthy. Like Cochrane, Rosenhan and his team learned that it's easy to get into a mental institution, but it is much, much harder to get out. The participants were kept in the institution for an average of 19 days, one of them for 52 days. They were forced to take psychotropic medication, which they sneakily spit out, and were eventually discharged with a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia in remission. Of course, being dubbed in remission isn't exactly the same thing as being labeled sane, and that was just one of Rosenhan's criticisms of the system. It viewed mental illness as an irreversible condition, almost like a personality trait rather than a curable illness. Part two of his experiment came later, when Rosenhan shared his results with a teaching hospital and then told the staff that he'd be sending more pseudo patients their way in the next few months, and challenged them to detect the imposters. With that in mind, out of 193 new patients, 41 were ferreted out as likely or suspected pseudopatients. The thing is, Rosenhan never actually sent in any pseudopatients. In the end, Rosenhan concluded that the way people were being diagnosed with psychiatric issues often revealed less about the patients themselves and more about their situation. Like, saying you've heard voices one time might catch a doctor's attention a lot more than weeks of normal behavior. Naturally, people criticized his methods and his findings, but his experiment raised a lot of important questions, like how do we define, diagnose, and classify mental disorders? At what point does SAD become depressed, or quirky become obsessive compulsive, or energetic become hyperactive? What are the risks and benefits of diagnostic labeling, and how does the field keep evolving? Now that's a great question. Let's talk about it. So defining psychological disorders, we're going to be using the DSM-5. That stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's five because it's been revised five times. It contains descriptions, symptoms, and guidelines for healthcare professionals to diagnose and to help treat some of those mental disorders. It was created way back in 1952, been revised five times by psychiatrists. Remember, psychiatrists are medical doctors, so they have a medical degree, so they're psychologists, but they can also prescribe medicine because they are doctors. Originally, it was for World War II veterans and later insurance companies. Now think about this. Why would insurance companies care about 
defining mental disorders. Well, it comes down to money. If they're going to pay for treatment, they want to make sure that there's a clear criteria of what is and what is not a mental disorder. It's continually evolving. For example, homosexuality was declassified by the APA back in 1973. It's less adding and deleting. It's more recategorizing. For example, OCD used to be an anxiety disorder. It's different enough that it kind of has its own category now. This is helpful in finding connections between illnesses, help manage patients' expectations, also help find treatments. There's lots of positives. The negatives, however, um, can be damaging with the stigma, like negative stereotypes, maybe group discrimination, even could turn into like a self-fulfilling prophecy for the patient. So the legal system, we'll get into a couple of terms right here. So one is confidentiality laws. They protect individuals during a psychological health session. So that patient-doctor relationship is confidential. Insanity is a term I'm sure you've heard of before. It is a legal term, and it is determining whether an individual should be accountable for crimes that they committed um, for their criminal behavior. Andrea Yates is an example of this. She It's super sad. It, she had a history of depression and episodes of psychosis. Psychosis is the separation of like reality, not knowing what's real and what's not real. She was at the time off of her antipsychotic medication. Uh, antipsychotic medication can have some really serious side effects. So they're trying to manage it with her doctor, but she was off her medication at the time. She was not supposed to be left alone with her kids. Sadly, she was. Um, super sad story. I have a video here. Uh, I'm not going to play it right now, but I have it linked down below. It's just a news story kind of about what happened. Um, she did end up killing her children. She was found guilty of murder. But later, in a, in a later trial, it was overturned by reason of insanity. Um, so she was not in a mental state where she understood reality and shouldn't be held accountable for her actions at that time. Now, she is currently and probably will, will be always in a psychiatric hospital. Um, she's probably never going to leave uh, because her mental disorder is so severe. Now, the, the idea of like pleading insane or insanity is extremely rare. doesn't happen a whole lot. So the sociocultural model, I want to give you a couple examples here. This is interesting. How thinking and behavior vary across cultures. So there are some disorders that are specific to particular cultures. Let me give you a few here. So this one, I'm going to try and pronounce it, Hua Byung. This can be found in the Korean Peninsula. It's examples of overwhelming anger related to perceived unfairness. It really only happens in that culture. Um, caused by unresolved, long-suppressed anger the next one, Taijin Kyofsyo. Sorry, I tried. It's a social anxiety disorder specific to Japan. It's an intense fear that a person's body or their bodily function will embarrass others. This is really interesting. So years ago, women in Japan um, in public restrooms would sometimes go in, flush the toilet, then use the bathroom, but they would flush the toilet beforehand to get some noise going so other people aren't hearing what's going on. Today in Japan, there's lots of public restrooms where they actually pump in noise of running water or just white noise, but it's that same idea of they kind of want to cover up those sounds. So it makes sense in this culture why this anxiety disorder has kind of developed over time. A muck in Southeast Asia, um, sudden explosion of homicidal rage caused by perceived insults. Um, it is from the term running amok, so like um, out of control or dangerous behavior. Then lastly, susto, this happens in Latin America, and it's severe anxiety along with physical symptoms caused by what's to believe a religious, magic, traumatic event where your body and your soul are separated. Again, uh, specific to that culture. Zoom. All right, let's go over a couple of these models of psychopathology. It's the study of mental disorders and from different perspectives. So the first one is biological. This is called the medical model. And this is when disorders are caused by neurobiological factors. So think like genes, chemicals, um, specific uh, physical areas of the brain like schizophrenia. We know there's less gray matter in certain areas with people that struggle with schizophrenia. This is the predominant model and they use pharmaceutical drugs for treatment. The next one would be behavioral. This is uh, believing that disorders are learned through conditioning now, a sub approach of this is biopsychosocial. So it has social, psychological, and biological ideas all included. 
Cognitive is a uh, logical, irrational, maladaptive thought processes, how we process, how we think through things. Psychodynamic, you'll remember with Freud, the unconscious, um, really our behavior is, is based on our past, um, desires, and some urges that we have. Humanistic, our behavior is determined by the environment that we're in and our ability to grow. And then finally, we have evolutionary uh, behaviors based on these traits, these specific traits that are passed down, inherited through natural selection, um, specifically for survival. So let me go through a couple of these approaches real fast. And we're going to get into these more when we talk about treatment of psychological disorders, but just a quick overview right here. So first off, behavioral, some strengths and some limitations. Conditioning can rewrite behavior. That's absolutely true. And it's really good for specific disorders, but there's not a lot of focus on the biological aspects, specific brain chemistry. Whereas biological is just kind of the opposite. It's objective and concrete data, but it might miss the environmental causes to specific disorders. Biopsychosocial, it's more complete with those three different approaches, but sometimes those connections between the three can be difficult to find. Cognitive, we're able to rewrite our thought process. This is really good for anxiety disorders and phobias, but it doesn't always account for specific emotions people are going through. Evolutionary, we can compare evolutionary stages, but this might actually be better or more effective with animals. Hold on. Zoom. Humanistic, adaptable to a variety of different people, but it is definitely based on subjective experiences. Psychodynamic, both nature and nurture are included, but really this can't be proven. And finally, sociocultural, um, those examples we had just a minute ago, observations in real wor world settings, but it's hard to control for different variables when you're studying them. All right, guys, we did it. We did it. We're done. Question time. Let's do some review. Look at that picture down there with me. Awesome. Karen, psychiatrist, attempts to treat Karen's generalized anxiety disorder by prescribing anti-anxiety medication, working with her to change her irrational thought processes that trigger her anxiety, and working with her family to try to reduce those environmental factors that have been causing more frequent panic attacks. This approach is best described as humanistic, psychoanalytic, behavioral, biopsychosocial, or medical. Look at the picture. What do you think? B for blue shovel? Nope. Uh, C for cilantro? That's not cilantro. It is D, biopsychosocial, not dirt. It is D for dig because it's almost planting season. I love planting tomatoes. Question, Rosenhan study, tell me about this, showed positive correlation of mental illnesses and stress factors, confirmed the connections between physical vulnerabilities and sociocultural stressors that elicit symptoms of psych disorders, provided evidence that men are diagnosed at higher rates than women for depression and anxiety-related disorders. Hold on provided insights into the causes of schizophrenia or illustrates the negative influence psychological labels can have in the perception and treatment of people with mental disorders. What are we looking at here? It's a city. Yes. The answer is E for electricity because the lights, it's bright outside. I don't know. Last one, a mental disorder generally defined as not knowing the difference between right and wrong, an anxiety disorder with dangers, of hurting oneself, a prolonged problem that interferes with an individual's ability to cope in society, a long-term problem that can be only cured with medication, or a long-term problem that cannot be treated with medication. What are those guys doing? D for date nights, sounds about right. C for corn, popcorn. I love popcorn. We're going to go with C, a prolonged problem interferes with individual's ability to cope. It is a comedy. They are going to watch a comedy film right there. Awesome job today, guys. You're the best. Do me a favor. Write me a quick one word, 20 word or so summary of these notes. Look over them. Take a minute. Give a quick little summary. It's going to ingrain it in your brain. You are the best. Great job today. Other videos, if you're interested, I don't know. My face is really low. That's better. <laughs> All right. Have a good day. Happy Mustache March, everyone. You're the best. Don't forget. Be kind. It's backwards. Backwards, be kind. Mustache. Mm. That was a good protein bar. Time for more coffee. <sighs> good stuff.